Thank you. One of the most fascinating fields of science is that which we find underwater. And here, the infinite variety, the number of species of fish, the beautiful color patterns, and of course, the grace of movement is a thing of unending wonder. Now, among the tropical freshwater fishes, undoubtedly, the Siamese fighting fish are the most colorful, and certainly they are among the most belligerent of all of these fishes. Now, these Siamese fighters need uh, no excuse for fighting. As soon as they are brought together in a small place, the fins are expanded, and in a very short time, they start tearing at each other's gill covers and at the fins. Fortunately, uh, neither fish is usually killed as a result of these fights. But in Siam, a man will wager all of his possessions on the outcome of one of these fights. Everything that he owns, including his house, his children, and even his wife, he will bet on which fish will win. A very beautiful fish, and that's the Siamese fighting fish. Now these are just a few of the rare and exotic fishes that we have to demonstrate for you here in Science in Action. Now it's possible to keep Siamese fish alive in the aquarium, provided you separate the males at the time they're about three months old. You place them in separate containers. The females, on the other hand, are quite docile, and so you can keep them in a large container by themselves, and they usually do not fight. We're going to examine some of the interesting methods whereby these tropical fishes are able to, well, first of all, to procure their food. What are the methods that they use? And then secondly, um, what about uh, protection from enemies? What are the factors involved there? And then the third point, uh, what about special adaptations that some of these fishes have had to make in order to be able to withstand the rigors of the environment? Now, coming back to this first point, procurement of food, undoubtedly the most fantastic method of getting food is that demonstrated by the archer fish, a very interesting fish that lives in the Indo-Australian region. These archer fishes are capable of uh, putting out a cigarette at 12 feet. They have pinpoint accuracy at four feet, and they can knock down an insect that happens to be flying over their pond without any trouble at all. You may have read about the difficulty we had at Steinhardt Aquarium, in which some of these fishes uh, became disturbed over the uh, increased uh, size of the light bulbs we put over the tank, and so they answered in the only way they knew how. They aimed little jets of water at those light bulbs until they broke them. And they broke so many that we finally had to work out another scheme in order to keep lights over the tanks. To give you an idea how the archery fish is able to do that, we have a... Uh, schematic model here, and I'd like to point out that in the mouth of this model, in the archer fish, there is a groove. We can't see it too well there. Of course, here's the tongue, and as the mouth closes, that tongue seals the groove and forms a rifle barrel out of it. So then all the archer fish has to do is compress the gill cavity, and it goes something like this. Fire one! And the archer fish has knocked down his prey, which happens to be swimming or flying in the air over the tank. Well, as we say, undoubtedly, one of the most striking methods of obtaining food is what the archer fish does in spitting at his food. Now, what about these other points? What about uh, protection from enemies? How are various types of fishes able to be protected uh, from their enemies? Now, under natural habitat, of course, there's a lot of vegetation uh, in the area, and so most fishes are protected from their enemies by means of hiding. In other words, if a larger fish chases them, they dive immediately into vegetation, and they hope that they will be lost. Well, now, when you bring a lot of these fishes into an aquarium and put them together in a small place, you have to give them vegetation also in order to be sure that they're going to have some place to hide. And so <clears throat> we've invited to Science in Action Mr. Tommy Hoshiyama, who's an expert on aquascating. Ap how are you, Tom? Good evening, hey, Doctor. Uh, can you give us an idea here with this tank uh, how you would go about setting this up to provide maximum protection, also provide a spawning area for any fishes to go in here? Certainly. Before I do, Dr. Harold, I've got a diagram of what this tank will look like when we get through here. These numbers represent different plants that you see laid out in front here. In other words, this will be the scheme that the tank will have after you finish it. Exactly. Fine. Now, what's the first step? First step, of course, we have to put in some gravel. And this gravel is already washed, as you can see. That's washed gravel? So we'll just pour this right in. All right, fine. Now, I'm going to time you on this and see how much it takes to, uh, how much time it takes to do this. Okay, Doctor. Now we'll put in a couple of ornamental rocks in here. This manner. Now we'll go ahead and do the planting. This first plant I picked up is anacris. That's anacris. That's right. Fine. Good foliage and full gives a lot of hiding protection here. This one here is called Kabamba. I see, that's a very beautiful that's one. It's a very nice plant. It certainly is. Now, 
this a little bit different from the usual scheme. I think most people plant their tanks, put the water in first, and the plant second. That's right. Now, this is much faster, isn't it? Yes, it is, Doctor. <coughs> this is a hornwort, Doctor. That's another nice one. Now, we pick up this snake-like grass. This is called Vallisneria. Vallisneria, yes, right. I know that. And this, of course, is all arranged in a different pa definite pattern. So if we have larger fishes in this tank, and they might want to chase some smaller fishes there, the smaller fishes would have a place that they could uh, hide. Uh, hide, yes. Right. <coughs> now we pick up this uh, here. This is Sagittaria. Sagittaria. Mm -hmm. These are a little shorter, so I'm going to place them toward the front here in several spots. And the final plant here is Cryptochorin. Yes, now where will that go? Well, I'll put places right in front of the rocks. They're ornamental plants. And they should be in the front where they could be seen. Okay, Doctor, I think it's all ready to put the water in. Fine, let's, uh, let's see how you do that. You put this... Uh, Wax paper right over the top. Uh -huh. That's right. Put uh -huh. that down in there. It protects the fall of the water, you see, Doctor. Good. If you'll help me now, I'll, I'll fill this right out. There's a bucket right here. Very good. This is a 15-gallon aquarium, so it takes quite a bit of water. Well, I guess we're just about all done. Next step, the wax paper comes out? That's right. Take it right out. Oh, fine. Fine. Then you straighten the plants up? Straighten the plants right up. Fine. Now we're about ready for fish, I guess. That's right, Doctor. Got I've, got, I've got some fish right here. Oh, good. Let's put those in. Put these right in and we'll be all done. The last thing, there of course, go. is to put a reflector on top. Ready? Finished tank, and it took you exactly two and a half minutes. Of course, the thing again that we've demonstrated here is that there is not only hiding room, but there's a place for spawning if a fish wants to deposit its eggs. Very, very important. Well, Tom, thanks a lot for coming Thank over and demonstrating how you do this. It's certainly an aquascaping record. Well, now uh, some fishes hide. There are other fishes that have a natural protection in that they look like uh, various types of foliage. You remember a few weeks ago in Science in Action, we looked at a uh, butterfly that looked like a leaf. Here's the butterfly, and you notice how much it looks like this leaf, which is right down here, the leaf butterfly. Well, there is a fish that does that, too. It is the famous leaf fish, and we have two of them in this tank here. Now, usually these leaf fish don't move around very much. They're very, very slow moving. They hang face downward and the mouth downward until suddenly some food comes in the area, and then they uh, wake up and very quickly devour that food. The male has a little tab on the end of the chin, so that he looks uh, very much as though he had a piece of stem attached to his chin uh, when uh, uh, he was a leaf years ago. Of course, that's not the case. But these occur in areas in which there are a lot of leaves. And uh, a very remarkable way in which a fish is able to escape from its enemies by looking like something else, the leaf fish. Well, now, of other types of fishes, what about fishes that uh, get out of the water and perhaps run over the ground? Is there such a thing? Yes. And that is the famous mud skipper a tropical fish that occurs in mangrove areas throughout the world. Now, this mud skipper is, uh, is really quite a fish. It, uh, it's able to go over a considerable distance of land, and uh, you'll notice these uh, two small eyes on top of the head, and, of course, the legs. They're not legs, actually. They are the pectoral fins, and those pectoral fins are very, very important to the mud skipper because they enable him to crawl over the substrate. And here we see him crawl. Notice that track. Looks very much like a lizard. But don't let that fool you because the mud skipper is uh, extremely fast. The only way you can collect these on a, uh, a tropical mangrove area is to take a big butterfly net with you and try and run them down. And it's really quite difficult. That's the mud skipper. The most remarkable fish. It belongs to the Gobi group. They climb trees, but known to climb trees up to a distance of about uh, 10 or 12 feet. Make very good pets and you can feed them small bits of meat without any trouble at all. Handle them by hand. Well, now, from, uh, from the mud skipper, what would be the next uh, step? That's a fish that walks and runs. Uh, how about a fish that flies? You say, well, now, I know all about flying fishes. There are lots of flying fishes in the ocean. But now, there is a point, because the flying fish in the ocean actually does not fly. It merely volplanes or glides. And to give you an idea of the only flying fish in the world that actually flies, let's look at these hatchet fishes from South America. These fellows really fly because they move their wings just like birds, whereas the flying fish in the ocean uh, gets up out of the water and gets his momentum by using the tail and then stretches his wings out 
and glides as you owe your glider. This is the hatchet fish in South America, the only true flying fish. And you have to watch these fellows pretty carefully because if there's a small crack in the back of the tank, they will find that crack and they'll jump out of the tank and when you come in in the morning, you'll find them down on the floor. Well, now let's go to uh, something else. We've looked at the uh, various kites, types of fishes that have special methods uh, whereby they are able to escape from their enemies. Let's look now at the third point, which are the adaptations that some of these other fishes have developed uh, in order to uh, withstand the rigors of the environment. And probably the most famous one of that would be the African lungfish. Now, the African lungfish is somewhat like the common American brown bear. The American brown bear in the wintertime, if it's cold enough, hibernates. If he hibernated in the summertime, he'd be doing the same thing that the African lungfish does when he goes down in this mud ball. Now, the uh, waters in which the lungfish live uh, dry up during the summer, and so the uh, lungfish goes down in the mud and encases himself in this mucus cocoon and breathes through a little air pore here at the top. Now, he remains in this for several months until the waters return again, and he comes out of the mud cocoon, goes back, and swims once more. Now, we have one of those fellows in this tank, and I'd like to have you notice these peculiar legs. He looks more like an amphibian than anything else. Now, moving out over against the front, those don't look like fins at all. This fish has to have air. In other words, if we were to hold him under the water here, in a very short time, he would suffocate. He is entirely an air breather. That's the African lungfish. Quite often he walks along the bottom as though he were an amphibian, a salamander, or something like that. Now these lungfishes are found actually in only three parts of the world. This one comes from South Africa, as we mentioned. And there are three kinds there, and there's one in South America. And finally, there is a third kind in Australia, and that's the only place that you ever find them. The two in the types in South America and the one in South Africa, both of those are air breathers, and both of them make these mud balls. The one in South Australia, however, does not do that. Now, you remember a little while ago, there was a considerable amount of publicity about a fish that was found off the coast of South Africa, a missing link. That was this fellow right here. It uh, was named after the premier of South Africa, called Melania. Uh, it had legs, somewhat like our lungfish, which probably were used for walking along the bottom. And here was another one of the same type discovered in 1938. These two Crossopterygian fishes are missing links. Nothing like them has been discovered for millions of years, and their ancestors were not too distantly related from the lungfishes that we just looked at. Well, now, uh, passing on from the lungfishes, let's come back uh, once again to the Siamese fighting fish. Now, these Siamese fighters, if they happen to be in a small pond with very little oxygen there, they're able to come up the surface and gulp a bubble of air, take that bubble of air in and put it into a special chamber which they have above the gills. And that chamber works like a lung, works very much like our lungs. This sketch will give you an idea as to just how it operates. Here are the normal lungs, and up here is this special chamber, and blood vessels near the surface in that chamber enable the uh, labyrinth fish, as this is called, to take the oxygen out of the air. And so the Siamese fighter can live in water that no other fish would be able to live in. For example, we have them set up here in this tank. Each of these are males, and they're separated, as you'll notice, in their individual compartments. But these fish, uh, we could drop the level of the water down to one-third of what it is right now, and they would do perfectly well. In fact, one of the newer ways of displaying the Siamese fighter is in the brandy snifter. You put any other fish in here, and you'd find that he wouldn't last very long. But the Siamese fighter can live in this amount of water with very little difficulty. Now, this ability to take a bubble of air into the gill region, into a special chamber, is very, very important in the life history of the Siamese fighter because he uses that in building the bubble nest. So let's look now at a bubble nest and see what it would actually be like if we were to follow that part of the life history. Now here are the male and female Siamese fighters come together in preparation for spawning. Now the eggs are fertilized and very soon the two fishes separate. Now as the eggs are released by the female, they float downwards through the water. And the male darts after the eggs, catching them in his mouth, and then he blows them up into the bubble nest, which is right at the surface. And you notice those bubbles up at the top there. Those are bubbles, and each, each side of each bubble, there is an egg. Now the male is very thorough in his work, and he searches the bottom for any eggs that might have been missed. After repeated spawnings, the nest may accumulate as many as all several hundred eggs. Finally, the male chases the female away from the nest, and then he stands guard. 
Any fish that wanders too near will immediately be attacked and chased away. Now he continues to uh, pick up those eggs that fall to the bottom. Of course, the young hatch very shortly, and uh, he picks those up also and blows them up into the bubble nest. They remain there for a while, and then the male generally changes, and uh, uh, then the young have to watch out for themselves. Now, there's another type of fish that has this same special breathing pattern, this special chamber up above the gills, and that is the uh, famous climbing perch or walking perch. And we have two of them in this tank here. A very nondescript looking fish. Doesn't look like very much. It's also an inhabitant of the Indo Australian area. But this fish can live out of water for quite a period of time due to this special chamber. In fact, when their ponds dry up, instead of going into a mud ball like the uh, African lungfish, they. Uh, are able to survive by taking off cross country and uh, finding another pond. And so we're just going to put them down here and we'll have a race between these two types, uh, these two fishes, and see if we can get them to go down to the water here. Now the way they travel is by means of these expanded gill covers. Now notice how these gill covers are standing out here. Now I'll see if I can tease them into moving here. Now there they go. They don't seem to know which way they're going. They, uh, they uh, jump around for quite a while and if there is water in the area, why then invariably they will reach that water. Uh, I have to watch out for those gill covers, they're pretty sharp. Let's see if we can get going here, boys. Isn't that just a way with the fish and never do what you want them to do? Now these fishes, I've had them remain out of the aquarium for as long as eight or ten hours. Finally they jumped out, come back in, put them back in the water, and in a few days they're back as good as new again. This is the way they do it with these gill covers right here. Let's see if we can get going there, boys. That's it. I think these lights seem to have frightened them a little bit. Well, if we came back to the end of the program, I'm sure we would find that our fishes were down in the bottom end of the tank. I'm going to leave them here for just a little bit, and I know they'll take off here again very shortly. Well, now, among the various types of fishes that uh, uh, we've examined, there is one that I would like to tell you about. You know, uh, we use fishes for food. We also use them for sport. Tropical fishes, however, have not come too much into this picture. Just recently, there's been a new development I'd like to tell you about. <clears throat> Every aquarist knows about the Oscar. Its true name is the peacock-eyed cichlid, and we have two little ones right here now. now. These fishes, as adults, are very fine game fishes and extremely good to eat. They occur in South America and the Amazon region. Just recently, these fishes have been brought into Hawaii to be tested as an experimental game fish, and this is what the adult looks like. A very beautiful big fish. In this next tank, you can see these adults here. I'll see if I can wake this fellow up. Very edible and a fighting game fish if you ever saw one. That's the peacock-eyed cichlid or the Oscar as most aquarists know it. So sometime in the future, perhaps if you're in Hawaii, provided the tests that the Hawaiian Department of Fish and Game is conducting now work out the way they want them to, you'll be able to go fishing for this type of fish. Recent years, uh, cancer has become vitally important to uh, the research studies, especially that are being conducted uh, on fishes. And it's brought out a lot of new factors. As a result of some of this work conducted by the genetics laboratory of the New York Aquarium, Dr. Myron Gordon has done that work, some new fishes have been developed. I'd like to have you see some of those. First of all, this little fish here, which is called the bleeding heart platy, a very beautiful thing, sort of light colored with a brilliant red undersurface. And then in this next container, the leopard platy, a speckled form. And then finally in the third container here, the bleeding heart Wagtail platy. Now this fish, all three of these fishes in fact, do not occur in nature. They are fishes which uh, have been developed in the laboratory as a result of some of this cancer research. Well, now we've looked about, uh, looked at various types of fishes. Uh, let's look at some villains now, some things that we'd have to uh, avoid, especially if we were to go in the Amazon region. You went into uh, Brazil and asked uh, for a pair of scissors. You would ask for a piranha. And the reason you would do that is because hundreds of years ago, when the Portuguese first came into Brazil, introduced the pair of scissors, the name given the scissors by the natives was the same name as an object which they, for centuries before, had carried tied to their waist. This also was a pair of scissors. Actually, what it is is the lower jaw of the most bloodthirsty fish in the world, the piranha, the savage piranha. This is the fish that is credited, working in schools, as being able to reduce a carcass to a skeleton in a period of three minutes. Now the natives have a very uh, the natives have a very good way of uh, using these things. First of all, they use them for cutting hair, and I'll sacrifice a few of my locks here for this matter. But uh, oh, I cut myself too. You see, it cuts off hair very quickly, and then 
poison-tipped arrows. Now, uh, when a native happens to be shooting a poison-tipped arrow, naturally he wants that uh, tip of that uh, arrow to break off in the wound. And so the end of the arrow is nicked with this piranha jaw. And then when the arrow is fired and hits the target, the tip of that, the poison tip, will break off. So that uh, if you happen to be fortunate enough to uh, uh, be swimming down in some of these areas, the first thing that you want to consider then is the piranha. Let's look at him in the aquarium. Actually, at first, he looks like a very docile fish, but uh, don't be deceived. Because as soon as a little bit of meat with some blood drops into the water, then the personality of the fish changes. Let's see what happens here now. Suddenly, the fish wakes up. At first, he seems to be a little bit stupid. He goes around and he bangs the uh, side of the glass with his head. Let's drop in another piece here. Now, there he got it. Now, the aquarist has to be very careful when he's working with piranha because he may find that uh, he has nicked the end of his fingers, as I did with that pair of piranha jaws just a moment ago. So if you happen to be in an area in Brazil where there's no piranha, there's one other thing you should know about, and that is the electric eel. Now, the electric eel is the only one of about five or six different electric fishes that uh, is able to gain its food, to get its food by actually putting out an electrical discharge. It uses it as a method of finding and getting its food. Notice the way that that ventral fin moves back and forth. They're really a very beautiful fish. It isn't an eel at all. It belongs to the knife fish group. Well, suppose, uh, first of all, before we take this fellow out of the tank and examine his uh, electrical voltage, that we uh, look at the internal anatomy and see how he operates. First of all, there's a main battery that runs along the top surface of the body. Now, normally this puts out a discharge of about 200 to 300 discharges, impulses per second. There is a second battery located a little back uh, towards the tail. This battery is a communication battery. If the eel is feeling good, then he discharges 20 to 30 a second. If he's agitated, as he will be shortly, then it's something like 50 to 60 per second. And then a third battery that works in conjunction with the first, and we don't quite know just what that's used for. Well, let's take this fellow out of the tank here, and we'll put him on this trough and see um, what happens. Uh, with his voltmeter and also with a light. <coughs> you have to be careful there, Don, with that. The uh, fellow got out here, uh, we have got a problem on our hands. Uh, that's good. Now, I'd like to point out what we have. First of all, a pair of electrodes. Uh, secondly, a light, which will go on. That's tied right to the uh, electrodes. Next, a voltmeter here. And finally, an oscilloscope. Oh, did you get him there? That's good. Got him. Rubber gloves, as you will notice, which cuts down on the chance of uh, getting quite a shock for yourself. Now, if you can hold him down there, we'll put these electrodes down. Now, watch the light and also watch the voltmeter. Now, there the light comes on. The voltmeter is swinging over to the right-hand side. That's it. We're getting a little bit of a picture here on the oscilloscope. Now, let's reverse those two electrodes and see what happens now. Theoretically, he should now swing the needle to the discharge side. There it goes. The needle comes over to this side. And the reason for that is that uh, the eel is positive on the head and negative on the tail. So that when the electrodes are reversed, or well then we, uh oh, take it easy there, don't lose that though. Uh oh, one electric eel. These things are pretty hard to hold on to. They can stay out of water for quite a while. I think uh, probably what we'd better do is put him back in the container now. I think we've probably taken all the electricity from him we can for the moment. These fellows have put out a maximum of about 600 volts. Well, now, uh, just to review a few of the points. First of all, we've looked at methods by which fishes are able to procure their food. Secondly, we've looked at some of the uh, ways in which fishes are able to avoid their enemies. And then thirdly, we've looked at some of the special adaptations that various fishes have developed to combat the rigors of the environment. I'll be back in just a moment with the animal of the week. Our animal of the week is a newborn Bactrian camel. I say newborn because that's what the uh, case was some 12 days ago when Freddie was born. Uh, and uh, now he comes to science tonight. He's having quite a, trouble, a bit of trouble here. Incidentally, uh, Jack Shearer, can you hold this bottle? And if we can turn Freddie around on the side here, I'd like to point out that a Bactrian camel is the two-hump camel. In other words, these... Uh, oh, now take it easy, Freddie. Now these, uh, these, uh, these uh, are the initial beginnings of what will be two massive humps on the back of this camel as it grows older. Incidentally, uh, how fast will Freddy go, Jack? Uh, well, it'll take him about two years to get his full go. Two years, and uh, they are sometimes uh, noted for their ability to spit. In other words, if they don't like oh, somebody, they spit at them. Yes, Is that it? indeed. They, <coughs> that uh, the full go on. Let's try one. Oh, no, no, Freddy. Now, take it easy. Here's, here's the bottle right here. Let's see oh, what... Oh, it's wrong the whole bottle. 
Uh, how long do you keep him on this milk diet? Well, pro probably about uh, a month, and then we'll have to start giving him solids. And about a month on this, and now, is there anything special in this milk? Do you put in vitamins and all no, that sort of thing? No, it's just plain canned milk. Canned milk? Canned uh -huh. milk, uh, half and half. Now, what what will his first diet be? And I mean, what sort of food? Take it easy there. Well, you, know, you get all that bottle. Uh, it will probably be uh, some kind of boiled up grain or something of that nature, something uh -huh. soft. So he don't have any teeth yet. He's just starting to get his front teeth uh -huh. in the... Well, he's just about finished that bottle. I wonder what oh. happens now. He doesn't get angry oh, as our little polar cold. bear did some time ago. Yes, indeed. He oh, he does? Well, more. here, you take this. <laughs> <laughs> he wants more. Well, Jack, I want to thank you for bringing Freddie over so we can see what a newborn Bactrian <laughs> camel uh, looks like. He's really oh, a cute little rascal, and we'll look forward to seeing more of him in the future. If he's going to be hard to bring down here, though. <laughs> and for those of you, our viewers, we will look forward to seeing you again on our next program. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.